to the afternoon session. Uh, let's start the plenary on caring for patients with stroke, the role of the internist. And it's my greatest pleasure to welcome Dr. Martin Cooper from Kings Mill Hospital, Mansfield. Over to you, Martin. Uh, thank you, uh, Anodra, and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you very much for the invitation to your country, and it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking at this conference. Um, just recently, as celebrations for the uh, 70th anniversary of the NHS in the UK, my hospital invited me to write a little article about my experiences in the NHS. I, I hope they didn't feel I'd been there all that 70 years. I certainly haven't. Um, but I did reflect that certainly when I started my career, there was no such specialty as stroke medicine, and things have changed considerably since that time. Um, so why are we talking about stroke? Well, as you don't need me to tell you that stroke is uh, very common. And incident studies here in Sri Lanka have suggested, sorry, prevalence studies have suggested prevalence of one in 100. And perhaps one in six of us might expect to have a stroke uh, during our lives. Uh, it's certainly very serious, of course, and it's uh, here in Sri Lanka, it's the fourth commonest cause of death. Uh, that's more deaths due to stroke than um, due to uh, malaria, tuberculosis, and AIDS combined. And of course, it's the, uh, a leading cause of uh, adult disability. Uh, but more so, it's, it's very misunderstood. People think that stroke only affects old people. Um, people think that stroke is untreatable. And also that there's no preventative strategies. And again, a local study has shown that um, a, a third of all, uh, of all the general public would, more, would not even know that a stroke was affecting the brain primarily. Um, Two-thirds would think that there are no effective treatments, and really only a third of people uh, had any satisfactory, reasonable satisfactory knowledge of stroke. Um, so, stroke's serious, yes, but why um, stroke for the internist? Um, well, as you know, there are stroke units developing within the country, but I, I think to date I'm right in saying there's only about nine stroke units in the whole country. And... Um, in terms of neurologists, um, I think there's only about 45 neurologists or some figure like that. So clearly it can't be the neurologists looking after, after all the stroke patients. So as internists, as general physicians, you will of course see stroke on the general medical take. Um, stroke very much is a medical emergency. It comes on rapidly. Um, it has a poor prognosis, especially if left untreated. And it, but we do have treatments, and it may well be that a stroke patient uh, requires urgent treatment. Many of you will be familiar with the FAST, um, um, the FAST program, uh, which is designed to help the general public recognize the features of stroke. And, and making, for us as physicians as well, making a prompt and accurate diagnosis is, is a crucial part of the management of stroke. Um, the FAST test looks at uh, facial weakness, arm weakness, and speech deficits. And if there's two or more of these uh, deficits present, then the, uh, the likelihood ratio of this being a stroke is very high. However, um, if, the, if the score is zero, then the likelihood ratio is very low. The FAST test is great at identifying strokes in the anterior circulation, but less good at posterior circulation stroke identification. So strokes, patients presenting with dizziness, with diplopia, all sorts of those um, myriad conditions that you'll be used to, really are not picked up by this tool. But a new tool called the BFAST test adds in the examination of balance and looking for hemianopia, so eyes, balance and eyes, looking at hemianopia and diplopia. And adding in these tools certainly makes it more likely that we can confidently diagnose stroke. This tool uh, was developed, the Rosier tool, to help um, ED physicians especially identify stroke patients. So adding in the positive features of uh, the FAST test, 
with the negative features of um, early loss of consciousness, syncope, and seizures, which are less likely to be attributed to stroke, helps us more confidently recognize stroke. But even so, things can still be difficult. And here's a, a list of some common features. Um, those on the left-hand side that would uh, make a stroke diagnosis more likely, and those on the right-hand side less likely. The OCSP classification or the Bamford classification being uh, those syndromes of uh, total anterior, partial anterior, posterior, and lacuna uh, strokes that you may be familiar with. But even so, even using these, the, um, seizures, syncope, and sepsis will account for about a quarter of all suspected strokes. But of course, we do have effective treatment. And this has been around for some years. Um, but the uptake of um, thrombolysis it has been slow. That was true in the US, when, uh, where it was first licensed, true in the UK, and certainly true in, here in Sri Lanka. And um, thrombolysis rates stand currently at around 3% uh, for patients treated in available centres. But of course, um, most centres don't yet have that availability. So why hasn't uh, thrombolysis been taken up more uh, readily? Well, there are certainly barriers to treatment. Um, some of which we can, as physicians, be very much influenced in, but some of which we perhaps have to lobby for more central change. Lack of public awareness, um, I've talked about. Difficulty accessing hospitals, so the lack of um, difficulty with transport, with ambulances in rural areas. But there's also reluctance on the part of physicians. Um, these are some of the, the perceived difficulties that f physicians um, suggest. So a lack of neurology support, lack of radiology support, again, not things that we individually perhaps can influence. And I, I would suggest that we don't always need detailed radiological in interventions, and the majority of strokes, I would suggest, can be looked after not by a... don't, don't need the, uh, a neurologist to look after them, but can be looked after by a more generalist. But certainly physicians are worried about bleeding post-thrombolysis, and also express a lack of um, belief in the efficacy. Well, let's try and um, talk about that in a little while. When we deliver thrombolysis, we have discussions about uh, risks and benefits with patients. And we say that there can certainly be benefit uh, with thrombolysis. And the NIHSS score is a scale ascribed to stroke patients with a more severe stroke having a higher score. A score of three might be someone uh, with hemianopia and dysphasia. So treatment that can return an improvement of three or more is certainly very effective. And thrombolysis is undoubtedly a powerful tool. When we talk with patients, we use this little schema. Um, uh, I'll just try and find the pointer. Is that on the, on the top? So if we imagine we give patients, um, 100 patients with stroke, uh, IV thrombolysis, then the top figures in green, about a third of those patients will improve better than they would have done without the treatment. Clearly, some patients will improve spontaneously, just as some patients will deteriorate spontane spontaneously. But a third will improve better than they would have done without the treatment, whereas about three out of every 100 will deteriorate because of the treatment that we've given them. Um, and of course, it's important to deliver the treatment quickly. Here's a graph of the effect of treatment uh, over time. And the horizontal line is unity, so any treatment above that line is effective. Any treatment below that line is less effective. And the solid curve is the mean uh, treatment uh, effect, which, um, and the dotted line is the standard 95% confidence intervals. And you can see that those confidence intervals cross unity at four, four and a half hours. Um, meaning that at four and a half hours, the treatment is possibly as likely to be eff ineffective as effective. Um, but in terms of uh, hemorrhage, there's also uh, concerns and to some degree myths. Um, I'd like to concentrate on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the graph uh, here. Um, and on the top, on the top figure... Um, is the uh, looking at stroke um, time to treatment. And in the middle, the two bars are age. And you can see that the risk of hemorrhage is not increased with either of those, but it is increased with stroke severity. Putting all this together then, 
These are data I'm um, grateful to William Whiteley from Edinburgh to share in these slides. And this is data really reflecting um, the SIT's most thrombolysis registry. And each box, each grid is 100 patients. And what would happen if you gave 100 patients the treatment? Uh, along the top, the columns are looking at on the left uh, if no treatment were given. In the middle, if treatment were given between zero and three hours. And on the right, if treatment were given between three and four and a half hours. The rows down the side, the top row is for patients with mild stroke, the middle patients with intermediate stroke, and at the bottom, severe strokes. The colours are the modified ranking scores, and really just concentrate on the colours, um, that red and orange are very good outcomes, independent, um, yellow, minimal independence, and poor outcomes of being dependent or uh, immobile or indeed dead are the green, purple, and blue. And you can certainly um, see improvements. Let's, let's just look at that in more detail. So this is for mild stroke patients. So just to recap, in the middle is those treated early, the left is those not treated, and the right is those um, treated later. And you can see there's benefit across the, across the board there uh, for all patients. So with a greater part of that grid looking uh, red and orange. So we see that again in patients with moderately severe stroke. Again, a greater proportion with the good outcomes. And exactly the same thing we see even in severe stroke patients. So benefit across, across the board for all of, those, uh, all of those patients. So hopefully I've persuaded you that it's a good thing to give thrombolysis. Um, but how do we give it? Well, here's maybe some top tips for success. Um, some of which are from our unit um, in the UK, some of which from other units in the UK and also worldwide. I think one of the key things is to know that your stroke patient is coming so you can, um, you can be aware of them and uh, organise yourselves as, uh, appropriately. So we have a pre-alert where the ambulance or the first responder will ring straight through to the stroke unit. The nurses on the stroke unit will then alert CT so that CT scanner won't take some difficult case such as some CT guided biopsy or whatever. Um, and of course the stroke physician needs to uh, be alert. I, I need to know that I, uh, I need to make myself ready to go down to the ED or wherever it is that the stroke patient will come into. Important that the team knows in advance what they're doing. Um, so we all have clearly defined roles. Uh, the nurse knows what they're doing, the doctor knows what they're doing, the senior doctor, junior doctor and so on. Time is crucial, as I've already said, so don't waste precious minutes on dressing patients. I think a perfectly adequate examination for these purposes can be done with a patient dressed. No need to do an ECG straight away. That can wait for later. The important thing is to get the patient to the scanner so you can decide what treatment's appropriate. Nurses on the ward can pre-prepare the infusion once they know the patient weight. And if we take the drug with us, we can give the bolus on the, in the CT scanning room. And all these shave off precious minutes. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid generally to give thrombolysis. Um, but particularly, I'd say, don't be afraid to give uh, thrombolysis to patients with mild strokes, with low NIHSS scores. I've shown that even those patients benefit. People worry that, well, what if this isn't a stroke? What if this is a functional syndrome? Uh, well, again, uh, the risks of treating a functional uh, stroke are very, very low. The risks of bleeding within a brain which is normal are virtually nil. And Gary Ford from Oxford has said that if you're not thrombolizing functional strokes, you're really not thrombolizing enough. And I think I'd agree with that. Just a quick word about CT scans. Of course, we do CT scans to distinguish hemorrhagic stroke from ischemic stroke. Whereas there's a common myth that we're doing these scans to help diagnose strokes, which we're not, of course. The, stroke may, the CT may well be normal. And indeed, in lacuna syndromes, perhaps as many as 40% of CT scans, especially in the early stages, will be normal. Or it might be that the, the changes are very subtle. And here is a thrombus in the middle cerebral artery on the right-hand side. And in the same patient, um, the loss of the lentiform, uh, sorry, the insular ribbon on the left-hand side, sorry, left-hand side. Um, both of these changes in early, early change in CT and ischemic stroke. But it really doesn't matter if you don't see these or not. Just the point to make is the CT scan may be pretty unremarkable or may well be normal. That's not the crucial thing of the diagnosis.
the crucial thing is looking for those sudden focal loss. So it's onset of sudden uh, symptoms, focal symptoms, and negative, uh, negative symptoms, so a loss of power rather than positive symptoms, shaking or tingling or so on. So much for ischemic stroke. What about hemorrhagic stroke? Well, this makes up perhaps about 15% of strokes in the UK, a greater percentage in other parts of the world. And generally, hemorrhagic strokes are more severe than ischemic strokes. They have a bad prognosis. But, and perhaps because they often present with um, severe headache, with decreased consciousness, they often present uh, earlier than ischemic stroke. So they can present early and therefore give us the opportunities to deliver swift treatments. These might well include uh, the following, which have all recently uh, been shown to be have, uh, have some uh, benefits in the management of um, hemorrhagic stroke. Um, Anticoagulant-associated bleeds, whether warfarin or DOAX, control of blood pressure, and also we can consider hemostatic agents. Of course, in terms of anticoagulants, we're normally talking warfarin. Again, time is of the essence. And if we can have near-patient testing, either in the stroke unit or in the ED, then it saves having to wait for a long time for the INR to come back. If we can have uh, protocols for rapid PCC administration, so whereby you don't necessarily have to have a hematologist to give you the say-so, where perhaps you keep the PCC close to um, where you'll be delivering it, in the ED or on the stroke unit. So all these things can save precious minutes. In terms of blood pressure, so some recent evidence that there's benefit in treating blood pressure in, in hemorrhagic stroke. So in ischemic stroke, we, we, it's less clear what we should be doing acutely, but in hemorrhagic stroke, certainly increasing evidence that we should be intervening. The, inter the Interact 2 trial, um, the treatment arm, was aggressively treatment treating patients with a systolic blood pressure of 150 or greater, trying to treat them early and bringing their blood pressure down to 140 or lower and continuing that treatment out to seven days. And certainly this was associated with decreased hematoma expansion and a suggestion that there were some improved functional outcomes as a result. The outcomes perhaps less, uh, more modest than might have been hoped for, um, perhaps for, the, for some of the following reasons. Few patients were randomized within that first hour. Uh, the treatment between the, the, the blood pressure differences between the treatment arm and the um, aggressive arm were relatively modest, and large volume bleeds were excluded, but certainly some suggestion that it might be beneficial. Looking then at hemostatic agents, um, tranazamic acid, we were involved um, uh, with the TITCH2 trial uh, based in Nottingham, which randomized people to receive transamic acid. And again, some suggestion that perhaps some small effect on early death, but it was certainly safe, and perhaps if given more widely globally, might well lead to some improved outcomes for what is otherwise um, severe strokes. Okay, so much for individualized treatments. What about, um, what about organizational care? So, this is a table looking at the effect of treatments um, on patients. So we look at thrombolysis. So, so the pale gray, second down on the left, that's early thrombolysis. And clearly in terms of the middle column there, the number of 12 uh, death or dependent patients um, saved per 100 patients treated is certainly a very powerful treatment. But of course, can't be given to all patients with stroke. Uh, whereas acute, taking to patients to an acute stroke unit can be, this can be delivered to 100% of patients, not just with ischemic stroke, but hemorrhagic stroke as well. And as you can see, it has a very powerful effect. And really, by stroke unit, we're just meaning pay, pay, uh, a unit where uh, the staff are, um, have received education in how to look after stroke, uh, where there's enthusiasm, where there's an MDT that meets generally. So there's nothing that's not beyond uh, uh, the grasp of a lot of us. And actually, I think there's good evidence to suggest that if you um, do uh, start a thrombolysis service, then that generates momentum which improves the team performance as a whole. So stroke units and organized care is very important. Okay, what about secondary prevention? Well, we heard a little yesterday about the effects of cinnamon tea, which um, 
yes, is claimed to have all sorts of benefits and certainly does have, um, you know, pharmacological uh, basis behind it. Um, in terms of blood pressure, then, it's not a question just of bringing down the blood pressure in total. But here's some uh, graph following on from Peter Rothwell's work in, in, in Oxford. So looking at the ASCOT blood pressure lowering arm, um, it showed that uh, the benefits in, uh, there was a greater number of strokes prevented in, and death and disability prevented in the amlodipine arm compared to the calcium channel, uh, compared to the beta blocker arm, even though the effects on blood pressure were very similar. Um, why was that? Well, if you look more closely at the uh, blood pressure variability, then the calcium channel blocker arm certainly had a decreased variability in blood pressure, whereas there were spikes of peaks and troughs in the beta blocker arm. And it's postulated that it's these peaks of blood pressure that are particularly harmful in leading, leading to a prolonged ischemic damage and uh, microvascular changes and microbleeds. So perhaps the agent is important. And this was rep similar findings in the MRC trial looking at thiazides against beta blockers. So what about atrial fibrillation? Well, it's certainly very important. And one in, stroke, uh, one in six strokes are related to atrial fibrillation. Um, they cause bad strokes by whatever measure, whether it's mor mortality or um, de uh, disability or uh, whether you're likely to return home after your stroke. So um, these are certainly you know, very serious and I think looking for atrial fibrillation is a vital thing. Perhaps less mention of atrial fibrillation here in Sri Lanka, but I, I wonder whether it's because it's one of these things that, you know, if you don't look, you don't see. If you don't open your eyes, you won't be able to see something. And certainly if you just do a single ECG in the emergency department, then your chances of picking up, um, picking up atrial fibrillation are pretty low. If you repeat the ECG um, on the unit two or three times, then certainly that'll, that'll improve things. 24-hour monitoring will certainly increase things again. But if you really want to be looking for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which of course will carry with it um, just as severe a risk as established atrial fibrillation, then we really need to be thinking about longer-term monitoring and uh, potentially implantable loop recorders or something similar. But certainly look hard for atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is the commonest cause of stroke in elderly patients in the UK over the age of 70, 75, and is the commonest um, cause of stroke um, when we can't otherwise find a cause. Um, so uh, so-called cryptogenic stroke. Then paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is, is frequently the culprit. But again, people worry about bleeding in uh, anticoagulation. And, and of course, you know, that is, that is a risk. But people are particularly worried about bleeding in the elderly population. But of course, it's just this population that has the highest uh, relative risk of stroke. So um, their absolute risk of stroke is huge. So, if you look at the, uh, the benefits of uh, anticoagulating elderly patients, then compared to a younger age group, the older patient has more to win in terms of net benefit because of their higher absolute risk. So in summary, I would suggest that it's important to remember that stroke is common and certainly, as I've shown, very serious. And the prompt and accurate diagnosis is crucial, is crucial in effective management of stroke patients. I think key to remember is that thrombolysis is not only safe, but it's effective. And I think we should be moving from the time when we think of thrombolysis as something, uh, an add-on, and we should be thinking it really very much as a standard treatment. And certainly I would suggest that you're more likely to run into trouble for not thrombolizing a patient than for thrombolizing them. And certainly that would be my own experience. Patients accept that there are risks with treatments. But what they don't accept is that, that treatments are denied them. 
And then finally, I would say that, of course, targeted and appropriate secondary prevention is vital. I'd just like to thank all of my colleagues in the stroke team at Sherwood Forest Hospitals. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper, for that excellent talk on stroke. Uh, since we are running out of time, we'll, uh, we have to conclude the session, and I, I'll, I'll invite Dr. Priyankara Jayavardhana, Vice President of SLI System, to hand over the token of appreciation to Dr. Cooper. Thank you. Right, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the symposium on clinical governance. Uh, and may I invite Professor Devaka Fernando and Dr. Channa Heva Madhama to come and join me uh, at the head table, please. Thank you. In terms of an introduction to the symposium, ladies and gentlemen, clinical governance is a process of quality assurance within health systems. And then uh, we will listen to two of our colleagues from the NHS uh, who will speak to us on the clinical governance process in the UK and then uh, see how applicable it will be towards a healthcare setting like ours. They will perhaps tell us uh, whether the same seven pillars would be equally applicable in Sri Lanka, whether there would be other pillars we may have to add on, whether there would be pillars which we may consider not essential within a uh, low resource health care setting. Uh, and it is indeed a great honor and a privilege for me personally to invite Professor Devaka Fernando, my mentor and my guru, to uh, deliver his lecture on clinical governance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arosha. Uh, may I also mention that uh, this team's got together after 17 years, and it's an absolute pleasure to deliver this lecture chaired by uh, my house officer at Columbus South Teaching Hospital, and have as my co-speaker the demonstrator, post-intern demonstrator in the department those many years ago. It's indeed a privilege. It's customary to deliver a few conflicts of interest statements in lectures, so I've just put a few of mine, uh, but the conflicts actually are relevant to clinical governance because in the last 15 years, I've batted around a bit, dabbled in medical management, and in fact, in clinical governance. So shortly after arriving in the UK, uh, management sometimes is some people are quiet, some people have it thrust upon it, and some people are born to it. Uh, let me assure you that it was thrust upon me because no sensible person becomes associate clinical director two years after coming to a new country and nobody in their right mind takes on the post of assistant medical director to introduce clinical governance to a trust that is failing three years after coming to the UK. So I am truly certifiable. So take that in mind when you listen to the rest of my presentation. Since then, I've been involved in management at a different level, uh, but let me assure you that I am a clinician. I still do four clinics a week. I still do ward rounds on a ward, and I'm still on call. So I'm not one of these managers. So what is clinical governance? What does it mean? Why do we do it? 
how do we strive for excellence in professional activity? What feedback mechanisms do divisions and departments where I work have? And how do we manage risk? These are what I would try to cover in my presentation. So the, I will talk about the parable of the elephant and the blind men, but I realize that elephant conservation and uh, endangered elephant species are endemic in Sri Lanka in more ways than one. So I assure you there's nothing political about this slide. It was done well before last Friday. Uh, it's a state, it's one of the stories from the Buddha's parables, uh, and clinical governance means different things to different people. So what is clinical governance? Essentially, it's a system. It's a system which enables organizations and institutions to do the right thing. It's about creating an environment for people like you and I to deliver excellent services. Now, I'm sure you'll be aware that many of us deliver very good services, but the systems are not up to scratch. This is about developing systems to make them as good as the people who work in them. By the way, this is my plug for the uh, new inductees in uh, clinical fellows, just to get them onto the uh, same wavelength. So if I were to summarize what is clinical governance, it's doing the right thing at the right time, in the right way, in the right place for the right patient. Martin's lecture just established one place where clinical governance is so vital in ensuring the quality of that service. And I understand it's heavily audited and policed. So Arosha referred to the pillars. And these are actually the pillars of clinical governance. And on these, the conceptual house of care is built by putting the roof of governance. So none of this is management rubbish, as many people say. None of this is politics. It's the core of what we do as clinicians. Patient safety can be compromised by a wrong diagnosis, wrong treatment, delays in treatment, errors in treatment or techniques, and of course, faulty equipment medication errors, and of course, not involving the patient. So how do we prevent these? How do we mitigate against risk? So we have to deliver safe care by creating an environment, an ambience, where safety issues can be raised, a no-blame culture, to ask what went wrong, not who did what wrong. That's governance. This is achieved by sharing learning from serious incidents, reporting incidents using DATIX, which is the tool that we use in our trust, and reflecting on previous incidents as a team, as a multidisciplinary team, not, not just ourselves. Some of the things that we look at on the ward are pressure ulcers, because we've got valley dependent elderly patients on some of our wards. We don't like people having falls and breaking bones. As a person who runs an osteoporosis clinic, I'd rather prevent them than involve my orthopedic con consultants. And of course, we really don't want to have medication errors, particularly in insulin, which is in my pri primary subspecialty. And of course, as a trust, we are judged by how safe our environment is by the rates of healthcare associated infections. So it's not just a government target. This is about patient welfare and safety. And AKI, acute kidney injury, and sepsis are some of the priorities at the moment because they are some of the commonest causes of increased mortality. I won't touch on mortality reviews because my co-speaker is going to touch this uh, very extensively, so I won't mention any more. So how do we manage risk. First, obviously, we've got to look at risk and grade it. So let's do a simple exercise 
in assessing risk. So this chap standing barefoot on a metal ladder in a pool of water handling electric equipment, presumably installing electrical uh, fittings. So pretty risky, but if you stand barefoot, that's really risky, isn't it? So assessing that risk, stopping this from happening through silly rules like saying, wear rubber shoes, don't stand in a pool of water, insulate well. Uh, so clinical governance is also silly stuff like that. And many consultants in the UK think it's silly stuff. So what is this built on? Well, it's about how an incident develops. So there are organizational factors, workplace factors, personal factors, defenses, which we put in through our risk management. Unfortunately, sometimes incidents do happen with the best efforts. Why does this happen? Well, it happens because there are holes in those defenses. And this is explained by this thing called the Swiss cheese model. Now, it's not just Swiss cheese. Remember that the cheese is melting all the time in the heat of an overworked NHS. So new holes appear in places you didn't expect. So the risks of something happening, of something going through these new holes and existing holes in the system are very high. And that is risk management. It's a dynamic process. So clinical governance is not a static tool. It's a dynamic process. And it's about risk management. So why do we manage risk? Well, obviously, to make it safer. If I'm the chair of the board of management, I'd say, in addition to that, it's the risk to reputation. We get statutory requirements to do this. We might get fined. Whatever it is, it's still about harm. So how can we manage it? Well, it's a three-stage process. Identify it, document it, assess the chances of it happening again, and put that learning into practice. So this is the fundamental rule of clinical governance. But it gets a bit complicated. So how do we ensure best care and treatment? So some of the things we look at are ensure that the staff are up to date. So we do that through appraisal, see whether we've got our CPD points. And I just got some really good ones on stroke from Martin. So I'll definitely reflect on that in my mobile Royal College app and get my points. Um, and then I put that up when I go for my appraisal. Um, obviously, the rest of it is self-explanatory. Uh, good record keeping in particular is important because we do a good record keeping audit as a mandatory process in all our wards for all our juniors. They've got to do five sets of medical records and reflect on it. So how do we know treatment's effective? Well, there are clinical audits which are, some are national, some are local, and they can be due to gender internal medicine, acute internal medicine, or subspecialty. And if you're a trainee in the UK, you've got to do one GIM audit and one subspecialty audit because dual accreditation is there to stay, and we'll talk about that later. So there are local audits. So audits are not just something you do because you feel it's got to be done. It's a focused look at what's happening in your surface. There has to be an annual audit plan. And these are some of the things that we do. And the prescribing audit is another important one. Antibiotics, more so. What are we trying to avoid? We're trying to avoid never events. Never events are things, as you might imagine, things which should never happen. And these are some of the criteria on which we judge a never event and things we should do. So what are these? Well, there's surgical ones. There's the medical ones. And there are ones in general. So these things should never happen. Zero tolerance. We need to be a responsive service in terms of patient experiences. And these are audited. So forget about the car parking complaints. There are enough complaints or concerns about communication. They didn't know about something. They consented to something that they weren't aware of. All those are important. Complaints are something that we learn a lot from. And in my alternative job, since my partial retirement, I work some t one day of the week for the Parliamentary Health Service Ombudsman, where we review complaints which patients feel are unresolved by the trust. 
and there's a lot that can be learned from those. When somebody expresses a concern, it's not a personal criticism. It's a concern, and that's an attitude that is part of clinical governance. Compliments are good. We record them, we reflect on them, we feel good about them. It's not all negative. There's a friends and family survey where you ask people, would you really want your friends and families treated in this hospital? If the answer is yes, I think we are doing a good job, and that's done as a national survey. Is that all? Well, health and safety, which is also thought of as a waste of time, has a lot to do with making the hospital a safe place. And each of these is an induction lecture in itself for staff. I've just compressed some of the slides uh, into this. So all these, and if you're a medical manager in Sri Lanka, you'll appreciate these are what the College of Medical Administrators sorts out. And of course, the annual fire lecture, if you don't go for that, you get docked a year's pay because you don't get your pay progression. It, well, it's one of the essentials. If you're a manager or a leader, clinical director, medical director, you are judged on how well you lead. And there are measures of this uh, which are done externally. The junior doctors feed back on the junior doctors forum. That helps with this. So this is the worst form of leadership. Uh, and in my time, I have worked in circumstances like this. Uh, but I'm happy to say I'm not there now. And I'm sure all of you have felt that way at some point or the other. So how do we look at these? Well, we look at clinical performance indicators. We design these. We agree on them. And we use them to m compare ourselves against centers of excellence or our peers. It's a measure of our own performance by methods we agree on. It's not imposed on us. As a profession, we have the right to do that. And these care quality indicators uh, are fairly straightforward. Now, because this is General Internal Medicine Forum, I've decided to pick some from our acute medicine uh, list of indicators. And these are the ones that they look at. They're not unreasonable as you will agree. And sometimes, in my other hat, as a member of the governing body of a clinical commissioning board, we use commissioning for quality and innovation tools to incentivize some of these. So basically, we say, if you do well and excel in this, we'll pay you a bit more this year. Give you a bonus, in other words. So. This year's ones, acute kidney injury, sepsis, dementia and delirium, antimicrobial resistance, health and well-being. So it's a balanced scorecard. So if you do well on these, that means your local hospital does well. There's a conflict of interest, so I don't do it for Mansfield. I do it elsewhere, 100 miles away. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to improve patient care, use a patient-centered approach, reduce risk, learn from mistakes, and be accountable externally. None of these are bad things. They are not a threat to our independence. I think the most important thing here is it's clinically led. We need clinical engagement. So what is it about? Well, if it's these, every member of staff must recognize their role. So how do we do it in the trust? So in the next three minutes, I'll just show some slides about how we do it. Well, these are some of the things we do. Uh, they say that managing doctors is like herding cats. Some people try to do it this way, but that's not really successful. People who've tried it have failed miserably. So who is really responsible for all this? Well, nominally, it's the chief executive, the medical director, and the risk management team. So do you think you're responsible? Well, actually, you are. We all have responsibility. What can we do individually? Nothing new there. So each of these might have a bit of mandatory training attached to it. And I don't think any of these 
would be unreasonable. And there are methods of assessing whether we are doing that correctly and benchmarking us. That's clinical governance. The ability to report safety incidents is one, and this is a very important part of it. The ability to report, to discuss it in a non-threatening environment. So remember, if you spot it, you sort it. If you can't sort it, you report it. So I've tried to summarize clinical governance, uh, but it's basically a journey, not a destination. And um, if any of you fell asleep, that would be postprandial uh, sleep disorder, physiological. If I fell asleep, that's narcolepsy. Um, and so here are some references. I'll leave the slides. I'm very happy for them to be distributed. They are not copyright. Um, they're all my slides. And in terms of how we get clinical governance to work, it's got to be a hands-off growth. Each of these buds will grow on its own if the right soil and the right management climate is there. And that's where leadership comes in. And certainly I've been privileged to work with a medical director who's actually set the stage for this and has brought the trust up very well, nicely. And one of the shoots you notice is mortality, morbidity, which my colleague will be doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Fernando. Uh, I think we will take the questions at the end of the symposium. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Channa Hevamaduma? Channa is a consultant neurologist specializing in neuromuscular disorders at the Sheffield Hospitals Foundation NHS Trust, as well as the clinical, uh, the clinical audit lead for neurology. Channa, over to you. Thank you very much, Arusha, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, and I might uh, want to thank the in, uh, organizers for inviting me today, um, and also uh, for Professor Fernando, who is also my mentor um, as Arusha's, and for laying a nice platform for me to build my talk on. So uh, as Arusha said, I'm a consultant neurologist by trade. I also uh, do, do an audit lead role as a mortality lead role for my uh, directorate. Um, if I may draw your attention to this slide, um, like uh, in Sri Lanka, UK had a very interesting health minister who recently said that there are 750 avoidable deaths a month in the NHS hospitals. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is equivalent to two full jumbo jets falling off the sky and perishing every month. If this were to happen in the UK or in Sri Lanka, I do not think people will turn a blind eye to that. People will be very passionate about investigating it and making sure that lessons are learned to prevent it happening again. So if you stay with the airline industry theory, what are the odds of an aircraft falling off the sky? Is one in 1.2 million flights. It's extremely rare. But when this happens, people get very passionate about learning what are the processes which contributed to it and how we can prevent it. I'm sure like the pilots who try the last minute to prevent the plane crashing or avoid uh, the unexpected crash. The doctors also do try their very best to prevent harm to a patient, but sometimes incidents do occur and patients could die or they could be seriously harmed. But it is important that we learn from these mistakes or processes. When you talk about these processes, people will talk about human error. So what is human error? Human error is what you see as the tip of the iceberg. But what you don't see are the processes, the culture, and other manifestations which lead up to the human error. It is, it is likely that the human error is the symptom of the problem than the wider care system. It is important that we move away from the human, being focused on the human error. Human error is a normal part of everyday life and in, even also in the workplace. And it is a natural condition and occurrence that enables us to develop, learn, and function. So morbidity, mortality related learning and improvement, it could be more objective, meaningful, and effective. If we learn to move away from focusing on human error, but also 
focus on the system that led to these errors, I think we could increase uh, engagement of um, professionals who deal with health care, the policy makers, the managers, um, etc., in order to in ensure patient safety. Well, I work for Sheffield Teaching Hospitals Trust, which is one of the um, largest NHS organizations in uh, uh, recruiting 15,000 uh, staff and serving about two and a half million people in the area. But with this comes the challenge of having to deal with 3,000 deaths a year and three un uh, serious untoward incidents that Professor Fernando uh, mentioned earlier. With this comes the challenge of having to learn from these deaths and ensure that the lessons are uh, um, inculcated into the staff members and, and we prevent, uh, prevent the avoidable death. To do so, we need to work as a team to put the pieces of the puzzle together to learn the lessons. So in this cartoon, uh, you could see there's a river in the middle and on top of the picture is, uh, um, is the land that the process of managing after death uh, occurs and before the river are the processes um, towards the end of life before the patient dies. After a patient dies, the process of managing uh, the death crosses over the bridge and in doing so, the, sometimes the patient will go to the mortuary or if there are any concerns of the patient's death, the coroner's, coroner might be, be involved, the coroner's courts uh, uh, might happen. If there are no issues, then the relatives will bury the patient and, and, and then bereave. But before the death, there'll be uh, doctors, the nurses, healthcare professionals like uh, ambulance crews or the police, they would be involved. So it is important to remember that doctors' uh, uh, involvement is only a very small part. There are large processes involved around the patient's death. In resolving and understanding this puzzle, it is important to piece together different pieces of this puzzle. Structured judgment review of mortality is one piece in this large puzzle. Why is it important to review mortality is to be enabled to quickly identify concerns and feedback into the system to make sure that we don't do the same mistake again. We learn quickly that the one important piece of this jigsaw puzzle is, uh, to bring the rest of the pieces together is to be able to learn from every death. Now, if an organization is of a certain scale, you might be dealing with large number of deaths. So you might not have the resources and the man manpower to deal with each and every case. So therefore, your department or, or, or the hospital might want to decide that you apply a certain set of criteria to study each death. So in, in my department, although we study all deaths, we ensure that we focus mainly on the patients who are younger, that's less than 50 years of age, those who have been electively admitted for procedures, and vulnerable people like people with mental health or learning difficulties and dementia. And of course, if a patient's family or the patient has raised a complaint during their care, we make sure that those patients are uh, assessed carefully to see whether we have uh, missed anything or whether we can le uh, learn any lessons. Learning from death is uh, not something that is unique to Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. It is part of a national program called the National Mortality Case Record Review Program. And this program uses an evidence-based tool called Structured Judgment Review. Um, and this allows you to assess patients' death objectively and generate qualitative and both quantitative data. This is what it looks like. It has two uh, components. One is an assessment of the care of the patient that they received from admission to the hospital until death. In the initial uh, admission for the first 24 hours, mid, late, and overall care is scored out of one to five, which is a visual analog scale. Now, when we analyze the patient's death, the reviewer is expected to give explicit judgment of uh, what's happening. What is explicit judgment? This has to be based on the information at hand and whether to see the patient, uh, the, the managing team, the professionals have followed hospital guidelines and protocols. 
In other words, um, it is like telling somebody, well, on the weather report, it says that Colombo will have tropical shower tomorrow morning, so you're going out, I would advise you take an umbrella. That is an explicit statement. What is an implicit statement is your mother might say, well, son, you're going out, sky looks a bit dark, it's best to take an umbrella if I, because you might get wet. Now, that is an implicit judgment based on some evidence, but you, you make up the story in between the lines. We encourage the reviewers to make explicit judgment based on uh, uh, evidence and the protocols in the trust or in the hospital. We also look at uh, the avoidability of the death judgment. Now, this is scored between one and six. One means definitely avoidable death. For example, patient comes for a knee joint replacement but dies of penicillin allergy and the patient is known to have penicillin allergy and if somebody gave penicillin patient dies, then that is an avoidable death. Definitely not avoidable death is, for example, a patient uh, who may be 85 years of age, suffering with dementia, presence with a large stroke, and patient dies of a chest infection in the hospital. Well, you need to look into this death, but still, it might not be avoidable. So in between the scale are several other numbers, and, and, and it is based on, on, on the reviewer's judgment to decide whether the avoidability is between one or six. Every death that is uh, scored as avoidable, that means between one and five, will be very seriously assessed by uh, the clinical governance team to make sure that what went wrong. So when we assess these patients, there are a number of themes and different data sets that are generated. And these, not only by, we don't stop at looking at the patient's death and analyzing them when we figure out what are the themes which, generated, which are generated from this analysis, this, these themes are then fed back into the clinical governance process. So the managers, the clinicians, will be looking into improving the patient care standards based on this data. And there, as Professor Fernando said, there, this will generate certain audit processes to see if the existing care is in line with the gold standards published by the colleges or national body or international bodies. And it might raise concerns about, well, we might have to improve our transparency in care of our patient, uh, keeping the family and the patient at heart. This might also lead to certain research ideas and innovative ways of improving patient care. And that is how you use the information generated by uh, doing the mortality morbidity assessments. Um, in Sheffield, we have a, a mortality, mortality morbidity meeting every quarter and we have about 24 deaths every three months, and we choose cases to discuss. We don't discuss all the cases because that would bore the clinicians to death. So we, we select our cases based on uh, whether they are young, whether they have any underlying problems like mental health disorders, or if the cause of death is unexpected. For example, if the patient was admitted for Guillain-Barre syndrome in the UK, you don't expect them to die. If they die, then of course you need to find out what, what went wrong. So let me give an example case, and this is a 79-year-old man um, who was admitted very recently uh, to the ward, and he died after about 10 days, and his death certificate said he died of ischemic stroke, and uh, death certificate comes in two parts, and the second part said septicemia, secondary to urinary tract infection, and dementia. Most of my colleagues will say, come on, what is there to learn in this patient's death? He's, seven, he's very old. He's, he's, he's old. He's got dementia, he's died of a large stroke. However, as I mentioned earlier, this is a vulnerable patient, so patient with dementia, you, we might, there might be lessons to learn. And this patient's reviewer had given low scores. So based on these two factors, we decided to look at this case. So let me take you through the analysis. So, Okay, so um, I don't know whether you can see. So this patient uh, was, um, ha has had a couple of falls at home and, and the paramedics were alerted. Paramedics went to see the patient pretty soon and um, they had an ex so the, uh, the reviewer will assess the patient's assessment at the scene 
and they documented that this patient was fast negative, that means face arm speech uh, assessment for negative for stroke, but they recorded the patient had mild temperature and was unable to get up, so therefore the patient was brought into hospital. Uh, at the a &E, it was assessed that the patient has a previous history of seizures and probably this patient has had seizures and that is why he has fallen. So the reviewer scores that the assessments were done accordingly, very quickly, the patient was assessed in a timely fashion, therefore the score of five was given, which is good care. And when you move on to the initial assessment in the neurology department, the reviewer only scored three. And when you look at the reasons for that, uh, the junior doctor who assessed the patient has taken the history from the A&E notes because the patient was aphasic, didn't give a good history. You're expected to be able to uh, 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 assess the previous medical notes or call the patient's family to find, or the GP practice to find out more information. This junior doctor didn't do that. And furthermore, the patient decided, uh, sorry, the junior doctor decided to start the patient on an anti-epileptic drug at a dose that she saw on an old clinic note which says one gram BD of levetiracetam when the patient was actually on 1.5 grams BD. Now this was recorded as unacceptable and, and uh, in, 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 in the, uh, the below point, the reviewer says that care could have been optimized if the person who admitted the patient took an extra effort to go and do a proper documentation. So this raises the uh, uh, the concept of need to improve documentation, as Professor Fernando mentioned, this is an important aspect that we drive in our in our hospitals to improve documentation, and, and then also the junior doctor can't document if the notes are not there I I when the patient is admitted. So there are processes to improve availability of medical notes on the ward when a patient comes in, and then. The 20, next 24-hour care was assessed by the reviewer and doesn't give a five out of five, but gives a four, which is fair score. Now, why was this given? Uh, why was this score given? It was found that um, the patient's uh, brain scan, or MRI scan, showed multiple strokes. Registrar has done a fantastic assessment and, uh, and initiated the initial treatment. However, it was found that the consultant who was in, on call hadn't seen the patient within 24 hours. Now it is our hospital policy, a patient who was admitted through acute admission should be seen by a consultant within 14 hours. So this patient's care in that sense was breached uh, by the said consultant. So it was raised as a concern. And then when he come, came to the middle of the uh, uh, mid care of the patient, it was found that this patient has, um, has developed tachycardia and respiratory signs and this, the patient was running high fever. And then the, the team has recognized this very early and started the appropriate antibiotics. Now this is good care. And we not only pick up on, we don't expect to pick up only the bad care, but we also celebrate good care and also feed that back to the team so that they, we celebrate uh, um, achievements as well in the process of morbidity mortality assessments. When he came to the la uh, towards the latter half of the patient's care, the patient suddenly drops the GCS, and it was found that this patient have, has, has had a large bleed. The team managing the patient uh, initiates some palliative care uh, uh, processes, but does not involve the palliative care team until three days later. Now, in, in our hospital, if somebody was thought to be in the end of life, uh, it, is, it is considered extremely important that the patient is kept distress-free, comfortable, and less agitated. One of the processes we do is by involving the palliative care team who's, who, uh, who are experts in managing this. So the reviewer says this patient's care is only three out of five because end-of-life care process was not initiated. Now, how has this helped? How has this patient's assessment contributed to a care in my, on my ward? We do audits uh, uh, regularly on these processes of end-of-life care, sepsis management, documentation, and, and uh, sometimes the junior doctors are required to perform these audits as part of their training, and sometimes 
the clinicians who are concerned about patient care, who want to improve their uh, uh, standards and perhaps for their appraisal, there are various drivers for them to do these audits. And in, this, in one of the audits that they've done, it showed that not only this patient, there were several other patients whose end of life care was not improved uh, or, or uh, initiated in a timely manner. So this led to a departmental training day on end of life care and dealing with patients um, towards uh, um, uh, late part of their care. And then also there was a training program on advanced care planning. So this is how even an unavoidable case uh, um, with dementia and large stroke has led to learning from their death and change management and, and practices on the ward. So in summary, this patient, uh, she, overall care was 3.5, even though on the outset it might have appeared as if there's nothing to really learn from this patient's death, although this case was an avoidable death. So when we regularly analyze these patients' deaths, we find that you could va do various forms of uh, um, analysis. You could do a certain thematic analysis, or one of the simple analysis is a word, word cloud analysis of the different statements that reviewers make. You could see that when, when you look at the initial admission phase, the words like good and plan come as big, and some of them are appropriate. Um, so it is encouraging that we may be doing well. Having said that, we still also see statements like poor. I like to see this poor in a, in a much smaller font in, in going forwards. When you look at the end of life phase, the words like good care, come as very big, that means we are doing fairly well in those fears. But still, the words like palliative care appears very small, that means we need to increase our awareness and, and engagement. So common themes that uh, arise from analyzing these patients' deaths are the opportunities taken or missed during the patient's admission. And early warning score recognition is an important part of managing our patients. Senior review and case review timing and the fact that they need to be delivered on a timely manner is important in our department. So there, there are various themes that are generated and then this can lead to sets of data sets we can look into and we then inform the clinical governance process and saying that there's a problem in this department for antibiotic prescribing or there is a problem in this department that the consultants are not reviewing the patients uh, uh, in a timely fashion. So then uh, uh, the processes can put, be put in place to improve um, such failings. So it is not easy to, uh, um, as, as Professor Fernando said, herd uh, a group of uh, consultants um, and, and junior doctors to engage in, in, in clinical governance process because there's a tendency to believe that uh, this is only for managers. But if you are interested in improving patient care and safety, then I think you will uh, want to engage um, in this process. So resource allocation is a big problem because uh, none of us are paid to do this. Uh, so we do this on our, in our own time uh, because we want to improve patient care and safety. Um, and, and there are sometimes competing interests in the department. For example, if I have an M&M meeting or an audit meeting, uh, somebody will say, can you please give it up to uh, allow a professor from um, uh, and Mayo Clinic to give you a talk on polar bears in Arctic. So you, you'll be asked to give up your slot. So you'll have to fight f uh, to, to ensure that you know, we have time to disseminate the knowledge that we learn. And the other challenge we face is that when we identify problems, how are we going to plug that into the clinical governance processes? And there are, there are barriers to that as well. So in summary, I would like you to consider learning from deaths uh, an important process to improve outcome for your patients. And a standardized tool exists called Structured Judgment uh, Review Tool. This can be, you can modify this the way you want to use in your hospitals. And this will generate qualitative and quantitative data sets, which then over time you can look into see whether there are any themes. And I, I fully appreciate that this is the model that we have chosen and, and there are loopholes and one size does not fit all models. And I'd like to thank uh, the following people and also the Royal College of Physicians for sharing some of the slides. Um, and I'm like Prof. Fernando, I'm very happy for you to use my slides if you want to. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Hira Mathuman. Uh, thank, I thank both the speakers for sticking to the times that they were assigned for. And then uh, that leaves us with another five minutes for questions. Uh, and the floor is open for questions. I'm sure the erudite speakers will be more than happy to answer your queries. Uh, may I may I s get the ball rolling? Yeah. Oh, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Can somebody the lights are right? All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, could I ask whether the information generated through these structured judgment reviews uh, is that information confidential? Does it does it uh, get into NHS system? Because I ask this question because in Sri Lanka now we have a right to information act. So is there some some kind of uh, 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 sort of uh, regulation similar to that in the UK? Or is the information completely confidential so that uh, uh, the participants can be free of uh, in litigation? Um, so, so one of the important aspects in, in clinical governance is transparency. And, and um, th th there are problems certain trusts face because they covered up incidents. Um, but your question was more about learning from teams. So teams do not have patient identifiable information. But we do discuss the patients openly in the department. Um, it has been raised by the information governance uh, teams in my hospital. Well, can you discuss and, and circulate information relating to patients? Well, um, there is a slight risk on that, but we have accepted that risk. And, and, and the information is only circulated within the people who are involved because there is no other way to learn uh, from the mistakes. But the teams generated uh, can, can be uh, discussed widely and they do go on to what is called a trust dashboard um, if there are serious untoward incidents or uh, um, failings, the, the department is expected to put that on a dashboard which sometimes can be ac accessed publicly. I can just add the Data Protection Act is applicable, so there's nothing secret. When you come in Sri Lanka, the patient care, roughly, outpatient, 80% in the private sector, 20% in the government sector. But when you come to the inpatient care, 80% in the government sector and 20% in the private sector. So we do the bulk and we do a, in the government sector, we do a great job. Only thing we get criticism, you know, things happen place to place and uh, the newspapers, they highlight those things. So we feel that by doing little, little changes, something to similar to what you mentioned, we can prevent most of the things. Uh, I think we can prevent the majority because we do the hard work and Eventually, sometimes the, the doctors get the blame. So the, as you correctly said, uh, we, it's a teamwork and it's not only the doctor. There are lots of people involved in those things and they don't, uh, they don't uh, the get the blame. It's eventually end up with the doctor. In our country, the, when it comes to the jobs, the, the, when there's a duty, it's a job, nurse, doctor and, and the ordinary staff, mostly appointed by the politicians. So when they come to the hospital as kind of a, it's a junior workers, they have no idea. They are coming to a hospital and they are handling with patients. It's a just a job for them, for supporting the, the politician. So when we start this kind of uh, things like clinical governance, we have to educate from top to bottom, the doctors up to the minor staff that we are handling patients and it's a different entity. And we, I think we have gathered a lot from you guys and a uh, lot, lot. And uh, we can do that because, you know, that if we can work according to the international guidelines and we can ac work according to the international s standards of medicine, why can't we work according to the standard uh, clinical governance, so we also could do that. I think it's a good topic and it's an eye-opening topic and Ministry of Health, we have a 
separate quality secretariat. They are trying to improve the quality uh, in the health government sector in this country and generally support is good. So I think it's high time we all should get together and get your experience to our system and try to improve the quality in our, our, our system. Can I just respond there? Um, a few things about that. Uh, you use the word blame. So the most important thing is to create a no blame culture. Uh, in terms of the ministry, the habit of transferring doctors for punishment is something we don't have in the UK, so that's something that needs to be looked at. And um, the difference between the private sector and the public sector, well, uh, when you notify things, when you have a system, you identify problems. So actually, if you look at the NHS and some of our hospitals, we seem to be the worst places for delivering medical care in the world. But is it perhaps because we report it? Is it because we are transparent? So that is something we need to look at. Certainly it needs to be improved. But lack of reporting merely hides the issue. It doesn't mean it isn't there. And, and lastly, to um, your comment about the quality secretariat, um, it's part of a cunning plan, as Baldrick would say, uh, we have trained people in our own hospitals, uh, and, and certainly Sridharan Satasivam, who is the Deputy Director of General Planning, spent uh, a year with us, and Upuli Vijaymana, who is, I think, going to be the next Director of Quality Secretariat, just finished training in Sheffield, where all this stuff goes. So there is something to build up with the College of Medical Administrators if there is the ability to work together. We'll take one final question. Thank you, sir, for uh, uh, answering part of my question, which I, I actually what I wanted to know was uh, you spoke about the no blame culture. Uh, we as trainees, we have been dealing with mortality morbidity reviews, but uh, then again, when we do uh, mortality morbidity reviews uh, in, in the ward setup, or I mean, my, my colleagues would answer, certain places where there is some sort of like a stigma even with your se seniors, your superiors, the bosses thinking, okay, is this training substandard or something like that? Is there, like you answered part of it, how, is there any practical way to, you know, get this no blame culture into our medical culture in Sri Lanka? So. Uh, let me quote something that you will appreciate about casting the first stone. Uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate that comment more than anybody else because you co use biblical quotes all the time. Uh, so, so I think none of us are free of these faults and we do need to reflect honestly on our mistakes. Reflecting on our mistakes does not make us substandard. I hope that answers your question. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Then that uh, concludes the symposium. May I invite... Dr. Priyanka Rajayavardhan, the presi uh, Vice President of the Sri Lanka Society of Internal Medicine, to come and hand over the certificate. Um, I seem to be the eternal chairperson for the afternoon, so I will ask my colleague, Dr. Janaka, to introduce the next speaker. Uh, good evening. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Rohan Gunawardana. Uh, he is the consultant cardiac electrophysiologist, 
the National Hospital. He'll be speaking on a useful insight into the arrhythmias and all we see. Over to you, Thank you, Janaka, for that introduction. Uh, maybe not the best time, the late evening might not be the best time to talk about arrhythmias, and I'll try to keep the few of you awake if I can. Right. Now, let me first say that when a clinician, whether it's a physician or even a cardiologist, or even sometimes even us, when we come across the arrhythmia ECG, sometimes we just step back and think, oh, what, what is this? Is this, this looks horrible, I can't, I can't analyze this. But if you really look at it, if you go by first principles, go back to your early learning as a medical student, as a junior doctor, I'm sure you will be able to analyze most arrhythmia ECGs adequately to be able to come to a conclusion, make a diagnosis, plan the initial management, and the, the future management as well. And I hope I can prove to you that this can be done by anyone in the next half an hour or so. This is a case-based discussion, uh, interactive, I hope. If I ask questions, I hope somebody may, may be uh, uh, brave enough to raise their hands. Can I just keep this going? Yes. Right, so the first patient is actually a 75-year-old man who presented to the NHSL about, uh, about nearly a month ago, and he has come with episode of syncope. He had several such episodes before that, the first episode, he didn't think much about it. He didn't go and see anyone. Second episode, he had gone and seen a GP who had said, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. Everything is fine, done some investigations. And this is third episode. He just dropped. There was no warning, and there was no relationship to any post posture or anything like that. And uh, otherwise, he was a very fit man. He said, oh, this is the first time I'm being in hospital, in fact. Right? And he was then admitted to the, uh, to the medical ward. And where a 2D echocardiogram was, was done and which was found to be quite normal. Now this was the ECG that he presented with. This is not his actual ECG. I am, uh, show, I'm showing a very similar ECG merely for clarity. Now let's see how we analyze this. Analyze this ECG. So going by first principles, the first thing we do when you see an ECG is look at the rate, and that's very simple enough, right? Pardon me if I'm going to be very, very basic sometime, but I think it's always good to go back to our basics and, 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 and uh, learn from that. So, simple enough, we divide 300 by the number of large squares between two RR intervals, and here we have about just a little bit more three large squares, which means that the heart rate is just below 100, so maybe about 90 beats per minute, which is essentially normal. Right? Now, the next thing that we want to do when you see an ECG is decide whether this is a sinus rhythm or not. And do it, but uh, to do that, you need to first see, is this P wave created by a sinus impulse or sinus uh, beat, a, sin a, sin a sinus beat, right? The best leads that we know, again, from our Twitch teaching to assess the P wave is lead two, but here, of course, in lead two is slightly hidden, the P wave, but still you can see there's a positive P wave. Another useful lead is lead if V1, where you see a bidirectional P wave, you can see the bidirectional P wave. So we assume that this is a sinus rhythm. At least, at least this P wave is, is created by a sinus beat. Now the question, when you say sinus rhythm, what we are saying is that the ventricle activation is, is by a sinus beat. And to do that, you have two criteria. That is, every P wave must be followed by a QRS complex, and every QRS complex must be preceded by a P wave. And here, if you look at this rhythm strip, you see that that is clearly there, yeah, though there is some, some problem here. Every P wave is followed by a QRS complex, and every QRS complex is preceded by a P wave. So this is sinus rhythm. Right. The next thing that we want to see is the PR interval, and here we see obviously there's something wrong, because we know that the normal PR interval, which is 200 milliseconds, roughly, or below 200 milliseconds, or one large square, has been exceeded here, and you can see that here the PR interval, from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex, is more, it's about one and a half large square. So there is a prolongation of the PR interval. That's the first abnormality we have detected on this ECG. Next, we look at the QRS complex. Now, we know that the QRS complex is generally narrow. It is around 100 milliseconds or two and a half small squares, right? 
And here we can clearly see again that this, P, this QR is complete, is quite broad, being about three small queries, and therefore there is a broadening of the QRS complex. Now we know that in si if, it, if it's a sinus rhythm and there's broad QRS, this is indicates that there is a conduction blo block, or there is difficulty in conducting the uh, electrical impulse along the AV conduction system. And generally we are talking about bundle branch blocks. And here you know that if you look at the chest leads, the normal ECG, there is usually uh, S waves in V1 and progressively R wave develops and you have a R wave in and firstly R wave in V5, V6. Here it is opposite and this pattern we know from again from our, uh, from our medical school teaching or even uh, early internship teaching that this is a right bundle branch block pattern. Remember that not always do you get this so-called RSR pattern in v, in V1 in right bundle branch block, but this is a right, this is still a right bundle branch block. So we have the second abnormality ECG, which is a right bundle branch block. The, the T inversions here are part of the right bundle branch block, so they do not really indicate ischemia per se. The next thing to look at is the axis of the ECG. Now this is something that can be very confusing, particularly if you are going to calculate axis according to the tower, um, triangle and make all kinds of decisions. But again, going back to our basic uh, to medical teaching, we have been t told, look at L1, look at L2. Right. If, the, if there's a positive QR in L1, and a negative one in L2, and so-called the QRX are leaving each other, there's a left axis. And if they, if they are, opposite direction, they are coming together or they are reaching, there's a right axis. So this patient has a left axis deviation. So essentially, this we have identified the abnormalities, which are that patient has a first degree heart block, patient has a right bundle branch block, and patient has a left axis deviation. Now this combination of these in textbooks will tell you it is called a trifascular block. What is happening here? Now we know that the AV conducting system has a, a AV node, the his bundle, which divides into the left right bundle and the left bundle. The left bundle itself divides into a left anterior fascicle, and then it divides into a then it goes as the left posterior fascicle. Now, what is happening here is that there is delay in the conduction of the impulse across the AV node. There's a block in the right bundle. There's a block in the right, the left anterior fascicle as denoted by the left axis deviation. So patient is only therefore conducting through the left posterior fascicle. So actually it's not three fascicles that are blocked, there are two fascicles. So I, I would prefer to call this a trifascular conduction defect rather than a trifascular block. Now you can imagine that in this patient, if this partially blocked AV node gets completely blocked, what will happen? Again, similarly, if the only conducting fascicle, which is the posterior fascicle of the uh, AV uh, conducting system gets blocked, what will happen? The patient will develop complete heart block, which is in fact what the patient developed and during the ward, patient had this ECG with the episode of syncope. So here you can see a, a clear complete heart block. We see a bradycardia. You can see that the rate is about, seven, about 40 beats per minute. And you can see that there are lots of P waves without, P, without QRS complex. So therefore, there is this no longer sinus rhythm, right? And this, we know, is a pattern that we see in complete heart block. Now, just look at this ECG. It is, I think, dif important to differentiate sometimes whether a patient is actually having a complete heart block or some degree of second degree heart block, right? If you look at this ECG, you might say that these QRS complex are actually generated by this P wave. So you can see QRS P here, QRS P here. But if you look very closely, you will see that as it progresses, the P QRS interval becomes shorter and shorter to a point where it nearly overlaps. Now this type of thing is physiologically impossible in a patient who already has some degree of AV block. So this is just coincidentally that the patient has a ventricular rate, escape rhythm, which is four times slower than the atrial rhythm. So it's just coincidence showing us that it might be a, a, a second degree heart block. This is important because the prognosis when it comes to uh, heart block is much worse for a person who has complete heart block who can very easily go into asystole and die. Whereas the person with a 
second degree heart block has some surviving fibers and may not be in such a, re at such a risk. Look at this ECG strip. You can see that here clearly the PR interval in, the, in what appears to be the conducted bead is stable. And this is clearly a, sec a second degree, a high degree of second degree heart block with three to one conduction. I have yet to see in my career a second degree heart block at four to one conduction. So basically, if you see something that you think is four to one, that is very unlikely, and most likely is a complete heart block. So this is what I see. Now the important thing is to differentiate between heart block and sinus node disease. And this side we find that when we get referrals from from clinicians, not just physicians or so registrars, but even cardiologists, 10 out of five, or eight out of 10 cases, they are mistaken. Right? And that is because the analysis, from, for some reason, the analysis is not correct. Look at this ECG. What do you see? Again, you have a bradycardia, a range probably of about 40 beats per minute. What is it what you don't, what is it that you don't see? Yes, yeah, exactly. You don't see P waves. So when you don't see P waves in a bradycardia ECG, it shows that the sinus node is not functioning. Basically, in this patient, sinus node is dead. So the sinus complete sinus standstill. So compare that to this ECG, where you can see more P waves than QRS complex. This is a very important uh, uh, consideration because when you see a, uh, a bradycardia ECG, if you see more P waves than QRS complexes, it's a AV disease, so AV node disease. If you see no P waves or the same number of P waves in a bradycardia ECG, that is a sinus node dysfunction. So what can we learn from this case? That in an elderly patient who presents with, any, with, with syncope and an ECG shows any type of AV block, it may be first degree heart block, it may be a winky back type, second degree heart block, just second degree heart block, think that it's a possibility that his syncope is due to an intermittent complete heart block. Very important. In fact, now the literature suggests that a patient, older patient, say in the 80s, who come with unexplained syncope with no other, no other possible cause, it may be worthwhile even putting a pacemaker without any evidence of complete heart block because that is the most likely cause, and that has been proven in many, on many equations. A useful rule of thumb is that in a brad if you have a bradycardia ECG, if there are more P waves than QRS complexes, it's due to some degree of AV block. And if there are QRS complexes are equal in number or more than P waves, it's likely due to a sick sinus syndrome. Okay. So the second case is a young man, and I'm saying young because now I think the age, the middle age has been pushed forward to 65, so we all, we all can consider ourselves young, and I think that's quite a good day. So this young man presented to the ETU, again at the NHSL of palpitations. He was, he was very dis distressed, and he compared lightheadedness, right? Now, examination, he was conf slightly confused. He was disoriented in time, had a low volume pulse, and a heart, very fast heart rate of 180 beats per minute. Blood pressure was low, and uh, he was basically very uncomfortable. On, so he was admitted to the, he was, he was, uh, he was treated at the ETU initially. He was given emergency treatment and he stabilized. Going back to his history, he had no significant medical history un, un, other than for, uh, he had a non STEMI about six years ago. So once the, uh, the ETU doctor uh, saw him, he was able to also get a 12 week ECG before he gave the treatment. And then thereafter, the patient was transferred to the medical ward, where they had done a, a, a lot of investigations. Troponins were negative. And uh, the only abnormality was a slight depression in the LV ejection fraction, which was 50%. Nothing wrong with the um, wall motions or no evidence of anything else. And this was the ECG that he presented to, to in the ETU. So now, going again back to our basic principles, we see that patient has a tachycardia. The RR intervals, they're about a little bit more than one and a half, one squ square, one, that's, uh, one and a half squares. That means about 180, this is correct, right? And here what we see that we don't see any P waves. So therefore, we, it, they may be hidden because of the tachycardia, but we still don't see P waves. So we cannot say this is a sinus rhythm. And if you look at the QRS complexes, they are 
broad. So here we have a QRS compressor which are long, which are more than 100 milliseconds, so they are broad QRS compressor. So here we are having a regular non-sinus rhythm abroad tachycardia. Right? If you look very closely, you might actually be able to see some P waves appearing here and there. So again, if you look at these P waves, right? And so this, this basically confirms that it is not a sinus rhythm. These are what we call dissociated P waves. So what is the diagnosis? A, 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 what do you call a regular broad complete tachycardia? What is the diagnosis? Is there, any, is there a differential diagnosis or not? I think for practical purposes, no. This is ventricular tachycardia until proven otherwise. And if you diagnose ventricular tachycardia in a patient with a, with a regular broad complete tachycardia, you will be wrong only 20% of the time. You'll be right 80% of the time, which I think for a medical condition is very, very good. Right? Uh, just to show the, you this ECG, this is again a broad complete tachycardia, but here you notice that there is some irregularity in the RR intervals over here. Now, if you look at this, we know, as medical students, we were told, if you feel a pulse and it is irregular, irregular diagnosis is atrial fibrillation. So here it is atrial fibrillation. So if, a, if you see a rhythm, whether it's narrow or broad, with this irregularity, irregular, think atrial fibrillation. Why? Because uh, treatment of this might be slightly different to a ventral tachycardia, and I can't go into it by such a complex uh, uh, subject in itself, but you, may, you have to make a note of this. Right. So questions. What was the treatment given? How did this ETU doctor treat this patient and stabilize the patient? Anyone? Yes, cardio, DC cardio version. And that, that is definitely the treatment to be given. So it is the first line treatment for a patient coming with VT. Why was the DC cardio version given? Because there was evidence suggests that the patient was hemodynamic unstable and it's very likely that if this, this arrhythmia continued, patient may have gone into VF or, and may have died. So this is a very important lesson to learn that in a patient coming with a VT and who is, has shown signs of instability, it is important to give urgent DC cardioversion. Right? Okay. The ETU doctor had taken pains to get a 12 week ECG. Would it have made a difference in the management if he didn't get a 12 week ECG? No, I mean, if he didn't get early, he see the, the rhythm strip would have been enough to diagnose uh, a VT and he could have treated the patient. But later on, it's very important for us to, be, to see a 12 lead ECG of the rhythm because one thing is that there are sometimes some uh, ventricular tachycardias which are not so dangerous. There are benign ventricular tachycardias and these are treated quite differently. Similarly, by seeing the v, v, uh, 12-lead ECG, we might be able to determine where the, where the VT is arising from. And that might be helpful, for instance, if you're planning ablation procedure, you would like to know whether it's the right side or left side. We don't want to go to the wrong side in the initial process. So it's useful to get a 12-lead ECG of a ventricular tachycardia, if possible. But you should probably not get 12-lead ECGs like this, which is an ECG taken about two years ago in a leading teaching hospital ETU. What does it show? This bizarre complex. Yes, this is ventricular fibrillation. So you don't really want to take a, you want, don't hang around taking 12 lead ECG of ventricular fibrillation. You need to cardio with the patient. Luckily, this patient survived. Now, what about the cause of the VT? The only thing we have with the history that the patient had a non stemi six years ago. LV function was normal, more or less, and there was nothing to show that the patient had any other problem going on. Uh, but what happens is that even in patients who have non stemies there can be little, small areas of myocardial damage which eventually fibrose. And these fibrous areas, uh, this, this fi the fibrosis matures to a point where later on they, are a they have become a substrate for VT. So these, it's very common to see patients who had a MI or a non stemi some time ago presenting six years, ten, five, six, seven years, or even 10 years later with VT with nothing in between. So it's a very important thing. Maybe if we do a, a CMRI, we might be able to find this, uh, these uh, five fibrotic areas. 
Then what do we learn from this case? Most important, to diagnose all broad complex tachycardias as VT, you will rarely be wrong. And that DC cardioversion is the first line of treatment for all patients with unstable VT, and it is safe, it is effective. Just keep in mind that an irregular, irregular broad contact, even a negative broad tachycardia, is very likely an AF, and therefore treatment might slightly differ. And if safe, if it is safe, if it is possible, please take a 12-week ECG before treating the patient. Okay, to a final case, this is a young woman who again presented to the ETU, again in NHSL, with palpitations. She was otherwise okay, the only thing she had was palpitations. And she was found to have a narrow complete tachycardia, again around 180 beats per minute, and uh, the ETU doctor gave a carotid sinus massage, which terminated the tachycardia. And this is what the ECG was that she presented with. Again, you see that if you go by first principle, yes, there's a tachycardia, right? You can't really see any P waves as such. Somebody might say well, it's just that it's too fast and the P waves are buried in the QRS complex, so you can't say. You can't really say, but you can't see P waves, right? And of course, it is narrow complex because the QRS duration is very, very short. So this is a narrow, this is a regular narrow complex tachycardia. Right? I can tell you now that if you see a narrow complex tachycardia like this, it is always a supraventral tachycardia. So you don't have to panic because this patient is not going to die on you. You have time to do something. So there is, is very often we have patients sent from GP practices. To the, to the ETUs and, and OP saying, oh, oh, there's something wrong with the ECG, please run, run to the hospital. This is very easily managed at even the most basic uh, uh, outpatient department because we can do a carotid sinus massage very safely. What about carotid sinus massage per se? Does all SVTs respond to carotid sinus massage? Now what happens in a carotid sinus massage is that it increases vagal tone and this causes transient block in the AV node. That is what happens. And can that terminate all our SVTs? Now we know that what the, 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 tachy, the supraventral tachycardia that are terminated, terminated by a carotid sinus massage are ones that use the sinus, sorry, use the AV node as part of its conducting pathway, as part of its circuit. And luckily for us, the two commonest ones, the AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, which is, which is due to duality of the AV node, and atrial ventricle reentrant tachycardia, which is generally due to, due to a accessory pathway, usually uses the AV node as his, one of his pathways or the part of his circuit. And therefore, by doing carotid sinus massage, we can actually terminate these tachycardia. Things like atrial tachycardia and atrial flutters generally merely use the AV node to conduct the, conduct the rhythm rather than as part of its pathway. And luckily for us again, if you take all narrow complete tachycardias, 95% of all narrow complete tachycardias are AVNRT and AVRT. Right? Okay. Right. So you have very happily, patient is very happy, patient wants to go home, you have done the ward round. And you have said, okay, this, get an ECG done and discharge her, and you've gone back to the lounge. Soon after, the HO comes running to you saying, sir, sir, there's a problem. This patient's ECG looks like this. What is happening? And you look at it, you always get a bit uh, worried, and you show it to your cardiology colleague who is next to you. Very, very unusual to have a cardiology colleague in the, uh, in the lounge, but anyway, she's there, and you'll show it to him. He says, oh, this is terrible. Uh, tomorrow I will arrange an angiogram at Langa Hospital, right? So what I'm going to do? So what I'm going to do? Are you going to go along with the cardiologist's suggestion? Are you going to start some anti-anginal tablets because the patient is 36 years, no other symptoms, he's fine, and refer back later? Or are you just going to reassure, reassure her and repeat the ECG in a couple of weeks. What would you do? Any show of hands? First option? Yes, okay. Second option? No? One or two? Yes, yes. But our third option? A yeah, few more. Right, okay. Well, actually, third option is what we should be doing. Why? Because this is what you call the memory sign. Right? This is a very well known thing. 
in arrhythmia after the arrhythmia terminates, especially if the arrhythmia terminates after cardioversion, they get these widespread Q, uh, T inversions, which are seen, which is usually resolved in about a couple of weeks. Right? So you, what you can do is, in a pa young patient, you just reassure the patient and you would get an ECG done in about a couple of weeks. If it's an older patient, it may be worthwhile taking a history to find out whether the patient has had an angina and uh, whether the patient had past history of ischemic heart disease and just do a troponin to see whether this troponin is negative. And if these are negative and it has no history of angina, then you can safely discharge the patient, get the patient back in a couple of weeks to your clinic, do the ECG, and just found it to be normal. And what do we learn from this uh, uh, case? That all narrow combat tachycardias can be con considered to be SVTs, don't worry about it, right? And the carotid sinus massage is safe and effective in terminating most not narrow complete tachycardias. And that diffuse T inversions following termination of, an, uh, of a, an, uh, SVT is, uh, is not due to ischemia, but due to a memory sign. So just to kind of recapitulate on the earlier learning points, that in a bradic patient who's coming with syncope, particularly if they're older patients, any evidence of AV uh, disease on the ECG, think the possibility of an intermittent complete heart block. And a useful rule of thumb is that in a bloody ECG, more PVS than QRS complexes, AV no disease. If the QRS complexes are equal in number or more than PVS, it is sinus node disease. And if you have a patient with a broad complex tachycardia, it is VT. Don't think otherwise because it can be rarely be wrong. And the DC cardioversion is the safe, effective, and first-line treatment for patients who are unstable with PT. Just keep in mind that an irregular, irregular broad complex tachycardia could be AF, so you might have to have to think twice about treatment. And if possible, and if it's safe, take a 12 week ECG before treating. Thank you. Any questions, please? That's a reflection of the, the, the clarity of the lecture. There are no questions. Then we will uh, proceed with the awarding of the certificate. May I invite uh, Dr. Priyankara Javadan again, uh, Vice President of the Sri Lanka Society of Internal Medicine, to come and hand over the certificate. Now it's time for the next uh, plenary. Uh, it's uh, going to be a talk by Professor Devaka Fernando. I don't think we need to introduce him. Uh, may I ask him to uh, speak on the resurgence of general internal medicine, the role of the internist? Over to you, sir. I think that um, thing about needs no introduction uh, has um, 
an amusing story behind it. I came with a colleague a couple of years ago. He's now a medical director down south. And we went out to one of the college dinners. And he made the remark to the audience um, uh, at some diabetes later dinner. I seem to be the only physician who was not trained by Professor Fernando. <laughs> so I felt a bit like that today. Uh, when, when Martin and I went round, uh, it seemed that I, there isn't a physician I haven't trained either as an undergraduate or <laughs> a postgraduate. So thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for having me. Um, Seneca gave me an interesting topic, and I'll try to do justice to it in an evidence-based manner and try to trace this journey of general medicine in relation to my own journey since I qualified in 1981. So that's the uh, conflict of interest statement. Uh, so let me assure you that I am board certified in general medicine in Sri Lanka. Um, and that's all I'm board certified in Sri Lanka. But I'm on the specialist register in diabetes, endocrinology, metabolic medicine, and general internal medicine in the UK. So I come here before you as a Sri Lankan general physician. Um, it was very important that subspecialities develop at a time in the 1980s. And three very young but impertinent MD candidates just after passing, named Janaka De Silva, Chula Herat, and Devaka Fernando, wrote a letter to the director PGIM saying, as you can see, we just like to train in nephrology, gastroenterology, and diabetes and endocrinology in January 1987. In June, the director PGIM wrote to the Director General Health Services and said, is this possible? And the Director General Health Service replied in a matter of a week saying, yes, it's possible, but we can't guarantee these guys jobs in these specialities. And so the Director PGIM issued a letter saying that the diabetes and endocrinology dual accreditation post in the Manchester Royal Infirmary would be recognized for PGIM board certification. And accordingly, I was board certified as such in 1987. So that puts me in perspective in terms of my involvement in general medicine and endocrinology. And subsequently, I, as you know, I was the first chairman of the Board of Study in Endocrinology and the first trainer in endocrinology in Sri Lanka. So at that time, while working in the university as a general physician, I had a special interest. And we organized all these training programs in endocrinology. This one was held at Triton, uh, which some of you may have attended. And I continued to train people in general medicine. And you can see uh, Arosha and Arjuna, along with the two endocrinologists. So, the first two endocrinologists to come to Sheffield, and the first, among the first general physician trainees to come to Mansfield, uh, came at the same time. So I've taken this thing for granted, but like in everything in life, it's nice to have another look at it, and Seneca has given me that opportunity. So let's look at a little bit of the history of internal medicine, or general medicine. It's a very old uh, specialty, and there's work going back the millennia to the invisible diseases. This was probably the first reference to things that are internal. But later on, this was used by Paracelsus, uh, who translated it is due to internal diseases. And then, of course, 
Boerhaaf, the famous Dutch physician, also contributed uh, to the lexicon by referring to internal medicine. I've scrubbed your slides, uh, Seneca. I'm not going to quote them again because you've stolen my thunder in the introduction. Uh, but, but it all starts, I've kept this one because this is the first association of internal physicians, which was the German group. So it very rapidly became the important part of medicine. In fact, if you look at people like Osler, it was medicine. There was nothing else. Internal medicine was the very definition of medicine as a, as a specialty distinct from, from surgery. Um, in the UK, we like to be different in everything. It's like driving on the other side of the road and so on. So we call it general medicine. But in order to keep in line with European stuff, somewhere in the 1970s, the term general internal medicine was put in. We don't expect to drop the internal thing after Brexit, but it, I think it's going to be there to stay. So the relationship between the specialist and the generalist and their relative roles in the healthcare workforce has been a hot topic. I personally don't think that general internal medicine has been dethroned. Because if you look at the literature and if you look at, if you ask your students, if you ask your juniors, it's one bit they enjoy most. Perhaps not being med reg in today's NHS. I agree that's a very daunting prospect and many people are put off by it. But that's badly managed work. It's not the work itself that people are, are, are detesting. It is the responsibility, the overwork, and the stress that it placed upon them. Medicine remains still a very important speciality preference. So during the 80s, this paper was from the uh, from Journal of Internal Medicine early in this um, millennium. Uh, terminology has struggled to describe changing trends in the practice of internal medicine because different people do internal medicine differently. So generalists and specialists are totally different animals. The specialists know more and more about less and less, and the generalist knows little about a lot. Uh, George Bernard Shaw had some pity statements. He said, no, no man can be strictly a specialist unless he's strictly an idiot. So everybody has to have a bit of generalism. It's about what your day job is that matters, but you can't actually be a pure specialist. And that, that, that makes sense. So we've agreed from the presidential address that we take a broader view of things. And we tend to use less gadgets, in the, and particularly with the opening lecture emphasizing clinical skills. We tend to rely a lot more on clinical skills and sound clinical judgment than most subspecialists. Perhaps exception of the neurologists who still remember their neurological signs uh, even though they have the CT. But we have to admit that subspecialities do form an important part of the healthcare workforce and, and they provide a core service for more complex problems. And therein lies the problem. They deal with complex problems. So this leads to a perception in the media, the public, and juniors that because they do things more complex, they got to be cleverer and better. So if you deal with the brain, Chan and Martin, you got to be the cleverest of all, and if you operate on the brain, you're even better. So the neurosurgeon is the pinnacle if you talk to anybody in the lay public, because they operate on the brain. So that's, generalism is less spectacular, less sexy, as they say in the modern trends, and it's less appealing than photo publicity. But yet, when the generalists do come up with some really important things, 
whether it's a sepsis score or methods of early diagnosis of common conditions, they are referred to as a specialist. So the word internist, I think, fits better, as the president said, than the general physician, because you can't be a specialist general physician. It sounds ridiculous. So how does it relate to the others? Well, certainly in the year 2000, the trend was that there was a clear distinction between internists who work in hospitals and those who worked outside. This was purely North American. So if you're an endocrinologist or a diabetologist in North America, you work in an office outside the hospital and you hardly ever go to hospital. Your patients are managed by a hospitalist. And it's the same uh, for other subspecialties. You were an attending while there were hospitalists in the hospital. Uh, in many other countries, this distinction was not very clear. And certainly the distinction between general practice and general medicine overlapped because you could have people called an internist in primary care. And there were colleagues of my father's, because my dad trained in the US uh, in the 60s, who were actually board certified in both internal medicine and family medicine. So you could actually do that. But that was commercial, isn't it? You, 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 somebody walks in through the front door, and you see them as a general practitioner, and they happen to have asthma, then you've got the credentials to treat that asthma as a specialist. And instead of the $5 consultancy fee that he used to get, they could get a $15 to $30 consultation fee for the specialist. So there's a system of valuation as well, which made the generalist less important than the specialist. So usually, the general practitioner is the first line practitioner. They, they, they treat gynecology surgery and so on. So we don't consider them a physician, although they do a significant amount of work that a physician used to do. So 25 to 30 years ago, well, possibly longer, people used to refer to the cardiologist a mysterious disease, which was a, quite an enigma in general practice, uh, where there was a confusing array of new and radical drugs uh, that were changing all the time. And this disease was hypertension. So we've come a long way. Hypertension is a general practitioner managed disease in the UK now. We don't have professors of hypertension. As a senior registrar, I worked with David Tunbridge, who spent his entire life studying hypertension. His PhD was on it, and he had a hypertension clinic. Uh, and I worked with him because all the secondary hypertensions came to him. So there was an actual university professor who specialized in hypertension. Not so much now. It's almost epidemiology. So things have changed. So this task shifting and skill shifting is also going to change the definition of internal medicine at some point. Um, there's also the criticism of the internist that we are breaking up into organ-based specialities. And societies like yours are trying to prevent this fragmentation. And this was known in 2000. So the concern in the US was around that time, as in, the, as in Europe. So this is from the European uh, Journal of Internal Medicine. The US invented the hospitalist. So the hospitalist was a hospital-based person who worked only in the hospital. If you came in acutely ill and went to a general internal medicine ward, you looked after them. So that's what we do in our day job. Uh, if I go into my departmental ward, <clears throat> we've got 24 beds. Only eight of those beds are occupied by anything that could be remotely called diabetes and endocrinology. And if you remove the six people with diabetic foot ulcers waiting to go to the vascular surgeon, there are probably the two patients who've got diabetic ketoacidosis who are excellently and well treated by the acute physicians who are just waiting to go home. So actually, there is no such thing as inpatient endocrinology, and the American guys who say it's an office-based specialty probably got it right. 
Uh, so most of the time, we would be general physicians. So I work as a hospitalist, in other words, one week in six, and we call it the hot week. So I like to believe that general medicine is alive and kicking, even within the so-called subspecialists. And as it says on the slide, most hospitalists were internists in the US. The training of internists has been a contentious one. You could be a cardiologist through a straight cardiology rotation. You could be a neurologist through a straight neurology rotation. You could be an oncologist through a straight oncology rotation. And that's there in Sri Lanka as well. Fortunately, if you want to be a nephrologist, a cardiologist, or a gastroenterologist, Sri Lanka still makes you pass the MD. That's not gone yet. But oncology and hematology are non-physician-based specialties in Sri Lanka, which is rather strange if you come from the UK. So there is direct entry into subspecialty training in Sri Lanka. It's not such an alien concept. So it's something that needs perhaps to be looked at. And the criticism is that it produces a narrow-minded, organ-oriented doctor. Some of the best general physicians I've come across are people who treat HIV. Now, there's a I believe there's a College of Sexual Medicine in Sri Lanka, uh, which again is a straight run-through program without general medicine. So one wonders how such a multi-speciality, multi-system disease can be managed without a training in general medicine. So it is possibly a historic accident of history, but it's something that needs to be looked at critically if the PGIM and indeed the Ministry of Health is going to look at the future of general medicine. So I'm a firm believer that subspecialists should have the common trunk of basic internal medicine in their initial training. Whether it is core medical training, which we have in the UK, in addition to that, there is a stream of general internal medicine training throughout. So if you're a cardiology registrar, a neurologic registrar, uh, you are still going to be med reg on an acute take for a significant period of time. So uh, from a UK perspective, it has always been the case. There's no run through. But I recognize that in other countries it has been different, and particularly in Europe, there was a lot of concern. So the competing arguments for the case of the disappearing generalist, the one, the pros would say they are an important and scarce resource and must be conserved, like the elephants. Others would argue that subspecialists can replace the generalists, and by team working, we can sit around the table, talk to each other, and then get around this. And from an organizational point of view, the US model is that the free market let the patient divide, decide. So you have people going to see, my, my relatives in Sri Lanka go to see, on an average, four different specialists by the time they get to 70. They see a rheumatologist, they see a diabetologist, they see a cardiologist, and if they get a headache, they might even go and see a neurologist. And this is one of the most difficult things for me to do as a, as a son, is to stop my only surviving parent from being taken by other relatives to a catalog of specialists. It's very difficult when you're miles away, but somehow I managed to keep, it, keep her safe so far. Um, so these are the competing viewpoints that were used to make major policy decisions. It depends on where you are, centrally controlled or market-oriented. So there was the medical outcome study, which was um, reported in 1992 about the economic consequences, and, uh, and it was dire. They said that it would drive the cost of healthcare up, but it would make the doctors better off. So it's not a patient-centered thing. It is a, not a taxpayer-centered thing. Subspecialization is good for doctors. It's very good. But if you work in an organization like the NHS, where it is taxpayer-funded, it becomes a resource-expensive process. 
because the number of referrals, the number of handovers that you've got to give, and the number of handoffs that you've got to give for an inappropriate referral all costs in time and money. So the more complex a system, and any medical manager will uh, appreciate this, the more complex a system, the more expensive it gets. So having more specialists actually makes it more complex. So do we need to solve the problem? Well, in the United States, this was a big problem in 1992. And they predicted these dire consequences. And again, the pros and cons. Subspecialists can, sub can provide them, so who cares if they disappear? So the comparison of outcomes for a discrete medical uh, condition was a, was a very um, good study. Uh, so essentially the lessons were that having subspecialists was necessary, but having generalists doing the bulk of the clinical workload was better. So certainly the value of this in highly specialized person is indisputable, uh, but even for the management of people with chronic disease, do we really need a specialist? Do we need a diabetologist was one of the questions that were asked then. And more on that later. So with society changing, certainly with thrombolysis and with some of the cardiac innovations, the person at the cutting edge is usually a subspecialist. And therefore society, again, as I said before, values them more. So narrowing the gap between generalist and specialist income might perhaps have some policy implications. So there's prestige, there's income. These are the drivers of the fragmentation into subspecialties. The, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy about self-worth, so non-economic societal incentives become necessary if this trend is to be changed. What about mentorship? Fortunately, I don't seem to have persuaded most of my juniors to become an endocrinologist or a diabetologist. Uh, there's enough general physicians and enough neurologists and cardiologists in the lot. But students are influenced by mentors. Students are influenced by the people they work with. They make decisions on careers based on people they admire. And I almost became a surgeon because a person I admired very much, um, Professor Dasri Fernando, was one of my mentors. I even did the FRCS Edinburgh and passed it uh, before I saw the light and did the MRCP. So it happens. It certainly happened to me. So the medical school experience, the people you admire, actually dictate quite a lot on your quality of uh, choice of specialty. And there are some statements here uh, that efforts to sort of in be, be more, more inclusive in multi-specialty departments. So the university departments in Sri Lanka probably offer a very good grounding for undergraduates because unlike in the UK, they are not mono-specialty departments. So that seems to be something to be preserved uh, and something which hopefully will endure. Obviously the job market determines it and this is very uh, applicable in the UK. People look at where the jobs are, where are the expansions going to be and in the 1980s and 90s, many of my colleagues who were looking for a specialty in the UK decided not to do neurology because there were massive cuts in neurology services at the time, followed by a massive boom later on. And it was the same for cardiology. There was the boom of interventional cardiology. So in the US, there were some really good policy decisions. The Robert Wood Foundation actually gave fellowships to fund training programs in internal medicine, and they were very successful. So despite these, many Western countries chose not to control although some do control generalist to specialist ratio. The UK offers free choice. I hope you don't mind my going a bit over. Um, so 
inclusion of generalist skills to general uh, medical subspecialties and pediatric disciplines is only a good thing. And, and those are now being put into practice, and I'll touch on the Royal College's take on this. So the New England Gen Journal editorial in the year 2000 addressed this. And they predicted that medical care will increasingly become a team effort. So this was the teams of subspecialists meeting at a multidisciplinary team. And it certainly has come true in a certain extent. Now, economically, I referred to those who are based office-based and work in hospitals, and this happened in the US. Now, this was predicted by the New England Journal of Medicine, who were quite concerned about it. So what is the environment I work in? Uh, and, and because um, I've been involved in training and because I've been involved in the college activities around the PACES and, and various international initiatives, it's just something of, I've had to be in my bonnet about this for some time. And we've managed to work on this through the colleges. And here's what the website says from the college. So particularly with older people and longer term conditions, does it really matter whether you have a specialist ologist looking after them or somebody who can look after all their conditions? What's more important, continuity of care or multiple handoff, handovers? So clearly, the decision was that we need more GIM specialists. And dual trained physicians Supporting the acute tech is the formula for which the colleges have supported as a mean way forward for the NHS. So everybody should contribute to non-selected takes. And if you, if you read some of the stuff around becoming an examiner, any, those of you who applied to be a PACES examiner would have read this phrase, the non-selected take. So to provide this high quality and to give that continuity, it is mandated by the future hospitals program that there should be a daily ward round, a daily ward round by a consultant. And Chanda mentioned that any patient admitted to hospital, whatever the condition, must be seen by a consultant within 14 hours. So that's a daily ward round. The 14 hours instead of 12 is because of the overnight, uh, the lack of resources to have a, or the lack of a need actually to have a consultant resident overnight. So everybody's seen in 14 hours. That, that is an essential requirement and a standard that has been set. So how do we provide that? By having acute physicians who, who, who run an acute service and by having the general internal medicine specialists who support them. So if you look at the college website, you will see two curricula, AIM and GIM. And if you study them, you see that there's significant amount of overlap. There's also a significant amount of overlap between the AIM curriculum and say managing an acute stroke and managing diabetic ketoacidosis. It does not mean that they are specialists in that, the stroke specialists still remain doing that, but the front door management recognizing these things and de delivering the patient to the right specialist is the function of these generalists. So this is the truth about the UK now. There are some like the gastroenterologists who say that you should have a special rota for, to deal with bleeding and therefore they cannot be general internal physicians. That's not universally true. It is true in my trust. Uh, but, but lots of trusts have GIM, uh, GIM on course for gastroenterologists. So now, nearly all trainees following the GIM curriculum to CCT will do it in parallel. GIM in isolation is very rare. So there won't be anybody who is a pure GIM specialist in the UK coming through a CCST program, a CCT program, but if one is getting on the specialist register through Article 14, it is still possible to get GIM alone as a mono accreditation. So it's always dual accreditation. 
This is important because if, if otherwise we might have a workforce crisis. Sri Lanka, for instance, you allow, if somebody becomes an endocrinologist, you've got to give them an endocrinology job. If somebody becomes a cardiologist, you've got to employ them as a cardiologist, and so on. But if there's dual accreditation, many of our trainees actually do GIM posts and AIM posts. So it's a way of workforce management as well. Perhaps not to the liking of doctors, but from a resource point of view, a very cost-effective way of managing this conundrum. So the Future Hospitals Commission report has highlighted all this, and it's available on the website. I'm sure you'll be able to uh, get this from there. So the UK view is that for the next decade, we'll see considerable growth in new GIM positions. It is the most, one of the most rapidly growing accreditations. So as you can see, the proportion of physicians maintaining a commitment to the acute medical take increased from 54.1% in 2010 to 64.1% in 2014. Of course, people over the age of 60 are told they can duck out of it, uh, although I'm still on the rota. So these are some of the problems that we have. Particularly frail elderly patients often get readmitted. And I'll just skip through this briefly uh, to talk about the extensivist, which is the new role for the generalist. This is based on a Medicare plan in the US, which basically said daily inpatient ward round. So much of the future hospitals program is based on this. A daily ward round by a consultant can improve patient flow, improve quality of medical care, and prevent readmissions. That's the basis of that study. And the results actually showed that lower lengths of stay, lower readmission rate, and below average inpatient utilization in high acuity population. So less admissions, basically. So why is this? Well, this is a study from Glasgow which showed that only 14% of people with diabetes had only diabetes as a specialty, as, as a disease. They had other comorbidities like congestive cardiac failure, chronic kidney disease. So does this mean that, like my mother's relatives, that these people should see four specialists? The answer in the UK is not. And with my hat of a clinical commissioner, this is a slide that somebody put on, saying that these all can be managed by a generalist. The A, B, C, D to G approach of diabetes, coronary heart disease, uh, congestive cardiac failure, some aspects of coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, CKD, the preventative aspects could be handled <coughs> elsewhere. So just to summarize, whether physicians remain within a specialty depends on personal and societal values, the market condition, the postgraduate training experience, the quality of practice in that specialty, and the sense of appreciation. All these will apply to Sri Lanka as they do to the UK. So in conclusion, I will finish with the last line, fulfilling the ancient and honorable role of, in the modern world will continue to be a goal and challenge to internal medicine, and I think it's in good hands in your society. So it's possible to be dual accredited. It's possible to train together. It's possible to train them together. And my apologies if I've over the cake. Thank you very much, Professor Fernando. I think you've given us a lot of hope that there's a resurgence of internal medicine. You'd be sad to hear that this year, for the first time, the Ministry of Health, uh, when they give us a list of allocations for uh, trainees to choose a specialty, that they've restricted the number of general internal medicine or internal medicine specialists or general medicine specialists to 50% uh, of the total number. It's never happened before. In the past, there was always any trainee who passes the MD could um, opt to do general medicine, and uh, there was no restriction on the number. So it looks like the trend is not ideal at the moment, but we'll work on it. So this brings us to the close of the session and the close of the conference. Um, uh, I'm very thankful to Professor Fernando for giving us the clo closing plenary. And uh, 
may I present you with the certificate. And thank you, everyone, for being here.